I don't think the Garden of Fan Band series going forward is something I'm going to be all that interested in. This game solidified to me in my mind that the Euphoric Brothers are going to take this project at least semi-seriously going forward, and I just don't find it all that interesting. <sighs> I told myself I wouldn't talk about it. I told myself I wouldn't talk about it. But this game, this game is actually goddamn manic. Garden of Ban Ban. Yep, we're talking about this game again, despite me saying we wouldn't. Here we are. I feel like somebody who keeps on seeing car crashes, but despite telling myself I shouldn't look at them, I continue to anyways. And speaking of car crashes... Yeah, we'll talk about that later, don't worry. Anyways, a lot has happened since we last checked in. The Euphoric Brothers really didn't like the response to Garden of Ban Ban 2, causing them to take an indefinite social media hiatus that is still going on today. Now, I think no reasonable person would ever condone harassment towards the brothers, and you shouldn't over just making a bad game. But some of the stuff they got angry about was more telling about the game itself than the people playing it, I think. Though, this occurrence did lead to a long charity event that ended up raising over $10,000, so that was good at least. But that's all a story for another day. It's been a little more than two months since the last chapter, and I genuinely thought that there'd be nothing to cover this time. So I promised myself I wouldn't be making a video on this. Expecting the Euphoric Brothers to be set in their ways and any other chapter to come after would be pretty much the same. But this chapter, dude. This chapter subverted my expectations, and that doesn't always mean a good thing. But at the same time, it feels like the Euphoric Brothers are actually kind of starting to learn. I know, it sounds Sounds crazy, but you're just gonna have to hear me out with this one. But enough lollygagging around the game. I think we have to ask ourselves, what is up with Garden 3? What has caught my attention so much that I decided to break my vow of not talking about this game to discuss it? Well, let's take our morbid curiosity and peek around the corner for the third time, friends. What happens in this one? The events of this game flow somewhat similar to the second game. Arriving at a lower level of the kindergarten facility thing, I honestly don't know where we are at this point. Regardless, this starting room is certainly a huge step up from the one in Chapter 2. But this game's biggest problem comes in right after we enter this environment. So much goddamn exposition. It's one thing to have a character talk through a loudspeaker for a prolonged period of time, but not allowing the player to do anything else until it's finished is downright criminal. The Euphoric Brothers were really pressed about doing refund speedruns of Ban Ban 2, so instead of just trying to make a longer and engaging experience, they'd rather just drag everything out for as long as humanly possible. This comes in with the dialogue as we just mentioned, but also in your tasks and simply trying to get from point A to point B. This cafeteria room is one of the first places you go after entering this area, and I kinda have to give it props for actually making it look like a cafeteria this time. We need to find 8 crayons to pick up and throw away to get the key card so we can get to the next area. But like every other deposit in this game, you need to put every crayon in individually before you can continue. Once you get the key card too, you have to ride through this massive void to get to each sector of the facility. This is somewhat similar to Ban Ban 2, but it's a lot more notable for the fact that it takes you exactly exactly 30 seconds to get from one side of the facility to another. I kid you not, a loading screen would genuinely be so much quicker than this. And you can do nothing more on this lift than just wait around until you finally get to the other side. Speaking of loading too, if you pay good enough attention, you can literally see the exact point the other side of the map loads out, which would have been so avoidable if they just added a fog effect in this area. But, as Ban Ban said, we have to go to the Aquatic Center and meet Stinger Flame. Lynn. You know, I don't know if this is just because I have a fear of giant creatures just in general, but this reveal was actually kind of unnerving. Like, obviously it's not scary at all, but I really did not expect him to be this size, especially since on the wall art, he's shown to be smaller than Jumbo Josh. We talked to him, though, and his voice acting is also not the best. You've had a rough day. I can tell. Ferris is voicing Stinker Flynn this time, and once again, every character one of the Euphoric Brothers voice just sounds like their regular speaking voice. After talking for a little longer, he sedates us and takes us to this absolutely insane set piece on an island, where he talks a little more and then we go back. I generally don't have much to say about the dialogue in this game, as a lot of it isn't really that important. Though we have a jeep next to him literally labeled the goddamn Stinger Mobile, which I can assure you will become more important in just a 
a second. Stinger Flynn's whole character is that he just can't possibly believe we came here to save our children, and that we are surely looking for something more. This alienation in thinking from protagonist to antagonist I think is actually kind of cool, as it could help set the character apart in being so cold and uncaring that our motivations as the player are straight up alien to them. Too bad Stinger Flynn only shows up like three times. But one thing that I wasn't expecting is that we actually get to play as Stinger Flynn. Also, Jesus Christ, hi. Being able to play as one of the monsters sounds a lot more fun in concept than it actually is in execution. We're taken back to this canon minigame from Chapter 2, and we have to do all three rounds of it again. But this time, instead of using rockets to hit the buttons, you got to use your Stinger Flynn powers. This is just as boring as it was in Chapter 2, and even having a new moveset doesn't really save how repetitive this minigame is. We wake up as ourselves again, and we're put into Sheriff Toadster's room. And although this place isn't really anything that we haven't seen before, this environment is certainly a step up from what we're to expect from these games. The light puzzle you have to do in this area was actually fairly clever and makes good use of the movement. Places like this prove to me that if the Euphoric Brothers spent more than just two months for each chapter, they'd probably be able to come up with some clever puzzles for the character to solve while they progress. But since they rush these things out so fast, it's dragged down by padding and reusing of old areas. After getting out of this room, our next objective is to build Nab Nab a girlfriend. Yes, I am not kidding. We head to the medical sector, where we are prompted with a mini game. Essentially, this monitor will display a color that we have to enter, take out with a syringe, and inject into Nabnalina. After which, we have to fix this arrangement of lights until they are all green. And we also need to hit the buttons on the walls as they light up, all while doing this before one of the gallons of Givanium runs out. Notice how I explained all of that in about two sentences? Let's see how long it takes her ban ban to explain this one. When Nab Nab escaped, it wasn't long before workers started to disappear. Of course, precautions and training can only get you so far, so we had to think of a more permanent solution. Nab Nalina was that solution. We had a theory that Nab Nab was as aggressive as he was due to his loneliness. We never got to put this theory right, as the collapse happened during the surgery. That's where you come in. You'll be carrying out the final steps of the surgery. Jimmy related procedures are very delicate, so I'm going to need to pay very close attention to these instructions. The hard part is already done. All you need to do is fix the right concentrations and inject your lipid of six times. The machine is about to stress up. When it's time to stay with that single field concentration, we're simply concentrating on the rest of the cups. Basically, you're going to have to stay with the machine. You're going to have to stay with the machine. You're going to have to stay with the machine. You're going to have to stay with a minute and 42 seconds. It takes Ban Ban a minute and 42 seconds to explain what we have to do. And it's not like we can start the procedure while he's talking, we just have to wait for him to finish. Now, even games I like can have this problem too, but the difference between that and something like this is that they don't overstay their welcome so hard in those ones. Usually, the exposition also doesn't make up more than 1% of the actual gameplay too, so there's that as well. This minigame itself is actually alright though. Once again, I like that the Euphoric Brothers are trying new things and experimenting with different ideas. Really, once again, the only thing dragging the scene down is the dialogue that just goes on for ever and ever. If we were to just be given this sign on the wall, I think most players would be able to understand what to do here, as not only is the sign less intrusive, but it's also so much more cohesive than the long, long stretch of dialogue. Heading back to the aquatic sector with the audio disc, we witness one of the saddest betrayals in fiction. At last, he's no longer miserable. I'm surprised they both weren't originally members of the mutants below. They'd certainly fit. This is... Even when being built a girlfriend, he gets killed by her in seconds after meeting. Fellas, I think Nab Nab may just be literally me. Our next move is to attempt to head to the progressive sector, but we run into Stinger Flynn once again and we have a little chat with him. He then puts us into an unconscious state again, and I kid you not, the most absurd thing to ever happen in a mascot horror game happens right after. Hey you. You're finally awake. We have a dream sequence where we are in the car with Captain Fiddles and Ban Ban right next to us and Opila Bird in the passenger seat. Oh yeah, Nab Nab is tailing our asses as well. Like this entire thing is a genuine fever dream. I could write an entire essay about this scene. The fact that Ban Ban makes a fucking Skyrim reference, the fan made pop song that they play on the radio, and the fact that Captain Fiddles is just staring at us the entire time. But alas, I'm gonna try to restrain myself and just say that it somewhat seems like the euphoria 
Warwick Brothers are starting to lighten up a bit with the internet's perception of this game, or at least trying to be more self-aware about it. Are they actually self-aware now, or are they just pretending to be the win over some of their detractors? I don't know, and I don't really care, because either way, this is still really funny. Stinger Flynn ends up crashing the car due to distracted driving, and we get thrown into another playable Stinger Flynn sequence. This one isn't nearly as egregious. You just gotta hit some moving buttons in this area that was actually blocked off last chapter, so that's also pretty cool. I know a lot of people had a problem with how fast the buttons go, and although yeah, I agree, it's absolutely stupid, it isn't that hard if you just consistently shoot the right corner until everything activates. After waking up, we're thrown into what is arguably the best section of the game. We're introduced back to Nab Nalina, and Nab Nab is lying motionless on the table. Our objective here is to find a way to exit this room, but we're on a timer. Every few seconds or so, Jumbo Josh will peek inside the room to make sure that we're still sitting down, meaning we need to act fast and make sure every time Jumbo Josh appears, we keep the room intact the exact same way it was when we first arrived. The concept here is fairly cool, and I think it was also executed fairly well too. It's pretty bare bones, really just needing to collect boxes in the ascending order of these doors to activate the buttons to get out. But I believe it does a good job of keeping you aware and on your toes. The best comparison I can make to this section would be like that one Resident Evil 7 DLC with Marguerite Baker, where he had to do the same thing. I don't know, I just like these kind of mini games in general, so I might be a little bit biased here. Our next order of operations is to finally get to the progressive sector. When we arrive, there's this math puzzle involving both Opila Bird and Tarta Bird, who is apparently the canonical father of the Opila Bird family, which is really funny. Our goal is to somehow get this baby Opila Bird to move without approaching it directly. To do that, we need the help of the Mimic! In all seriousness, this guy, aptly named Mr. Kebab Man, needs his Ban Ban cosplay to go out and be used as a distraction for the baby Opila Bird in the other room. To get this, we must travel past the eight doors to get to the boss fight room. Now, I'll give this as much benefit of the doubt as I possibly can. I can see what the Euphoric Brothers were trying to do here by setting up a feeling of suspense, but they don't execute it well at all, and it just serves to add even more padding to this already bloated with pointless time game. I believe what would have worked better is if instead it was just a few doors and maybe have the wall art of the boss we're about to fight visible as well, but noticeably scratched up in certain places so you can't tell exactly what it is. And yes, there is wall art for this guy, but it's in an easter egg room all the way back in the aquatic sector. The boss fight itself is pretty lame too. We gotta fight this weird chameleon turtle looking guy and place fireworks on his tongue to receive our party hats. The little tutorial scribble they give you also makes no sense. Noise equals button equals rocket. But I was not able to tell this was a rocket at first, I thought this was like an arrow or something. The boss fight took a lot of trial and error to understand, especially trying to understand the direction of the second head's projectiles, but I did eventually get the hang of it. With the party hats secured, it was time to go back and meet up with Mr. Kebab Man. Putting him in front of the appealing causes Tarda Bird to come down, and you need to jump on him to start riding the bird out like a horse. At this point, Apila is also by your side, and we need to put the baby on top of her. Stinger Flynn catches up with us one last time, and they are really playing into the pancreas joke from the first game. I kid you not, they talk about pancreases like four times in the script, and the main song of this entire chapter is even titled Pancreases. Judging by the evil Ban Ban design, I don't know if the Euphoric Brothers are just really big fans of the Venom movie or what, but this is getting out of hand, man. Once he's let loose after us, we need to play this glorified red light green light game with the two birds. When the light in front of us is blue, we need to speed up past Opila Bird to cross it first, and when the light is purple, we need to slow down and let Opila Bird cross before us. Failure to do this correctly results in what might possibly possibly be the funniest jump scare in these games so far, but that has literally nothing compared to the scene that follows. Stop it, you two. What?
I don't even know what to say here. Did they really just kill off more than half the original supporting cast in just one scene? If so, this move is incredibly bold of the Euphoric Brothers to pull. And it also makes for quite possibly the most unhinged scene to come out of any of these games so far. Well, it's either this or the car ride. I don't know, you gotta decide. The last remaining survivor of this encounter is the lone baby Opila bird, who follows you to the elevator as you both descend further down into the abyss. And that's where the game ends. Now, I want to spend just a little more time here to talk about more of why exactly this seemed to have caught my attention so hard to break my initial promise of not talking about Ban Ban again. The reason why I was so bitter at the end of my Ban Ban 2 review was because it felt like the Euphoric Brothers didn't try to innovate at all with what they had initially, which ended up making the second installment just feel like a more bloated, watered-down version of the first one, which I didn't even know was possible. I wanted to talk about Ban Ban 3 to be at least a little bit fair to the Euphoric Brothers. As I can tell that even though I can't say with confidence I like the game, I'm pleased with the fact that they're trying to do something new. Adding a new character with a completely different moveset, a full-fledged boss fight with actual stages to it, and a pretty large variety of unique set pieces. I even like how the map loops around itself in this almost Metroidvania style of backtracking. It feels like the Euphoric Brothers actually learned something while making this one. And although the models from an optimization standpoint are still absolute nightmares, and there's still so much unnecessary bloat added here that was definitely added just so you can't refund the game after playing it, I can still commend that they are actually starting to take baby steps into making something halfway decent. I know that this may come as a shock to someone who has been very critical about the mascot horror genre for more than a year now, to the point where it's practically became the main thing I'm known for, but I've come to an epiphany recently. Mascot horror was always stupid. Sure, some games obviously have more love and integrity put into them than others, but but ultimately, after FNAF, none of these franchises ever presented themselves to be taken at 100% face value. It seems like the Euphoric Brothers are starting to get that too, playing into some of the community memes and having a much lighter tone than the last installment. And if my prediction all the way back in January were to be proven too, and the Euphoric Brothers actually do start leaning into the stupidity of their games, then my respect for them, as well as many others' respect for them, would most certainly be raised tremendously. And I must say, I'm hooked. I'm actually really curious to see what the brothers will be cooking up for the next chapter, because although I want to deny it, the setup they started actually made me kind of want more. And I think it's because I'm finally able to accept that this series is my all-time guilty pleasure. I don't have to lead some imaginary crusade on the real integrity of mascot horror anymore. Mascot horror is stupid. It's been stupid for a long time now. And Garden of Ban Ban is unhinged. And that's why it's fun to talk about. Thanks for watching. One like equals one prayer for Nab Nab in these trying times. <laughs> I've been Dags, and until next time, see ya. Also, after my first playthrough of the game, I clocked in 2.2 hours total, so bravo, Euphoric Brothers, I really couldn't refund the game. You did it.